Hi, I'm Laura. And I'm Jill. And this is Crank Divers. Hello everybody, welcome to today's episode. Hello everyone. And today we have a lot of sword. We do have a lot of sword. So we're in the world, are we? We're in Germany today. Ooh, Germany. Yeah, I don't know if I've done it. Have you done a German one? I don't, I've certainly not Probably not, because I don't know how to pronounce German words. Yeah, I'm going to apologise. Are you going to struggle? <laughs> um, I think there was maybe a couple. I can't remember now. There might have been a couple of them, so I do apologise if I mispronounce anything. I'm going to try my bestest to get it right, <laughs> but <laughs> I can't guarantee. Well, I can't say anything because I'm rubbish at pronouncing stuff. I was just going to say you are uh, not great, are you? But we do try. So, we do, we do. We always give it a bash. <laughs> What's the name of your case? It's called The Vampire of Dusseldorf. Oh, vampires. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be honest, there's some quite gruesome parts. Oh, is there? So, uh, so you put in a wee trigger warning. Just a wee trigger. If, um, yeah, and there is one that does involve a young girl, I think, actually, one of the victims. So, right. Um, just in case anybody is triggered by that sort of stuff, of course. Yeah. As always, never offended. Totally understand. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, we always say that, you know, if anybody, we understand that people do get triggered by certain things. So, you know, if anybody does feel, no, that this isn't the episode for me, that's fine. Just, well, you know, we'll see you next time. Yeah, exactly. They're, they're, I mean, yeah, they're all bad, totally, but some are, some are yeah, different, worse than others, obviously. Yeah. So, um, well, you know, like true crime, you know, there's such a lot of different elements of true crime. So people can like listening to true crime, but they can still be triggered by certain oh, yeah, certain things yeah. of course and we would hate to you know trigger anything for yeah. anybody so as i said you know like i know even the biggest true crime lovers can not like certain parts yeah, of, of it of course you know? so you know if you if this, if you don't want to listen to something then of course we won't be offended just you know come back next time no but there are some gruesome ones in this okay so should we dive in let's dive into this one Okay, so Peter Curtin was born on the 26th of May, 1883. Oh, it's an old one. So it is an old one, yes. Um, and he was born in Milheim am Rhein. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but that's in Germany. Um, he was the oldest of 13 children. Oh, um, that's a lot. I know. I've always noticed more so in the older times and older cases. They definitely have bigger families. Yeah, but it's what they always say. They didn't have TV. Oh, that's true. And they probably didn't have, like, um, protection and stuff. Like, <laughs> yeah, there, yeah. Was, there probably wasn't much else to do. No, this is very true. So, yes, he was the oldest of 13 children who two of them had actually sadly died at an early age. His parents were both alcoholics. They lived in a one-bedroom apartment. What? Mm-hmm. So, 13? Well, minus oh, the two kids. Oh, so, oh right, okay. Well, so but actually, 13 in total, because 11 kids plus two adults. Right, yeah. Yeah, so 13 in total. Yeah, we're living in a one-bedroom apartment. Wow. So you can mm. imagine how... That... How? How, can I, how would that even happen? Like, you, there would be enough space for people to lie down and sleep. Maybe or sit on the floor, I don't know. I mean, it, who knows? But yeah, it wasn't obviously made anyway. Well, I'm just looking at the side. We're in a bedroom at the moment. I'm just looking at the size of this bedroom. There's no way we'd be able to get 13 people in here. Well, somebody slept in the living room. Yeah, they must but have. Yeah. Well, maybe in the kitchen or in the bath. Who knows? But yeah, so that's where they lived. So, Curtin's father would regularly beat his wife and kids, um, particularly when he was drunk. When he was drunk, he used to make his wife and children line up and then he would order his wife to strip naked and have sex with him while the kids watched. <gasps> oh, no. It's a bit disgusting, isn't it? Um, the dad did actually serve some time in jail for this, um, well, for the things that he did, which was 18 months, and that was for repeatedly raping his eldest daughter, who was 13. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. That's just the dad. It's not even the, it's not even the guy that's about to commit the crimes. Oh. Um, shortly after Curtin's mum divorced his dad, she obviously saw sense, mm. um, she later um, remarried and re- relocated to Dusseldorf, but without the kids like she just oh, right, went. Okay. she didn't she didn't take so did kids. she leave the kids with the dad yeah right okay yes yeah, so she just remarried and right. covered off to to Dusseldorf so clearly Curtin had witnessed some awful things in his short life as when he was five years old he attempted to drown one of his playmates wow 
So I think he'd obviously... That's a lot at that old. age, isn't yeah, it? I know. Um, four years later, he became friends with a local dog um, catcher who lived in the same building, and he began accompanying him on his rounds. And this guy often um, tortured and killed the animals that he caught. So, you know, Curtin soon became an active and willing participant in torturing the animals as well. Okay. So, I mean, you know, he's a short life and he's already seen a lot of stuff and he's now getting himself involved in... A lot of serial killers, they start with animals. This is it. So, being the oldest son, Curtin was often the target of most of his father's physical abuse. Sometimes he would refuse to go home after school and he would often run away from home for periods of time, you know, ranging from days to weeks. Uh, much of his time spent on the streets, he was in the company of like petty criminals mm. um, and misfits. So, it, and it, one of the, like when he was on the run, one of these times, he was um, introduced to you know various forms of petty crime. He, you know, which he initially committed as a means of feeding and clothing himself whilst he was living on the streets. So he just, you know, he was getting himself involved and mm. you know, bits and pieces, nothing like major, but you know, mm-hmm. just stealing and stuff like that. Um. So at the age of thirteen. He had a relationship with a girl um, who was his age. Um, and, you know, he, he was starting to have, like, sexual urges. Um, the girl would allow him to undress and fondle her, but she wouldn't allow him to have, like, full intercourse. So he turned his attention to animals, including sheep, pigs and goats. I'm sorry, but did you not think to put a trigger warning on about the animals as I, well? I forgot about the animals. Right, well... Sorry about that. Well, yeah, we've triggered warning for after the in fact. Yeah, sorry. He claimed his greatest elation... Sorry, I'm just, I'm just composing myself from my to stay. Um, he claimed his greatest elation was stabbing the animals just before he achieved orgasm. Oh, God, that's horrible. I think that was that was awkward, nervous laughter that you were confusing yeah, yeah, yourself. Yeah, that's what I was like confusing myself. Like, oh, that's something. horrible. Yeah, and um, he also attempted to rape the sister his father had earlier molested. Oh my god, this story is awful already. I don't, I don't think I want to hear it. Well, it gets worse. So in 1897, Curtin left school and began work as an apprentice molder. This lasted for two years before Curtin stole all the money he could find in his house and also 300 marks, which was what German money used to be before the euro. That was Dutch marks. Well, that's Dutch marks. Am I wrong? I don't know. Maybe. Dutch marks. Dutch marks or something. Yeah, possibly. But anyway, marks. From his employer. He then ran away from home and then he relocated to a place called Coblins where he had a brief relationship with a prostitute who he said willingly submitted to every form of sexual perversion he demanded of her. Um, he was actually arrested four weeks after running away and he was charged with breaking and entering and theft of his employer. And he was sentenced to one month in prison for that. So his petty crimes soon turned to something more serious. Okay. Murder. Oh. There's a lot of murder about to happen. Um. So he was carrying out one of his usual petty crimes, a burglary, um, and during it he encountered a nine-year-old girl named Christine Klein. She was asleep in her bed and Curtin strangled her, then slashed her twice across the throat with a pocket knife, ejaculating as he heard the blood dripping from her wounds onto the floor. I feel sick. The following day, he returned to a tavern directly opposite where he had murdered Christine, just so he could listen to the local reactions to the murder. That's sick. Mm -hmm. In the weeks following uh, Catherine's funeral, sorry, Christine, I've got Catherine, sorry, Christine's Mm. funeral, um, Curtin occasionally travelled to her grave and said when he handled the soil covering the grave, he spontaneously ejaculated. Oh, this man is disgusting. It gets worse. Um, So two months later, again, whilst committing a burglary, Curtin discovered a 17-year-old girl, Gertrude Franken, sleeping in her bed. He strangled her, ejaculating at the sight of blood spouting from her mouth before leaving the crime scene. But it seems that she didn't die. I don't, right. know, I don't think she actually died, did die. Um, just days later, Curtin was arrested for a series of arson attacks and burglaries, and he was sentenced to six years in prison. He clearly didn't well, behave in prison though, as he had his sentence sentence extended for a further two years just for like petulance and good. Keep him in there. 
Well, <laughs> clearly not long enough. Mm. So he was released in April 1921, and then after being released, he relocated to Altenburg, where he initially lived with his sister. Um, through her, he met a woman called August Scharf. Again, I'm not sure that's how you pronounce it, but I think so. Um, she was a sweet shop owner, um, and she was a former prostitute who had been convicted of shooting her fiancé to death. They actually got married two, um, after two years together. Um, and then they moved back to Dusseldorf in 1925, where he began two affairs with a servant girl named Tied and a housemaid named... M- I think it was Mick. Mick, her name was. I'm sorry about the pronunciations, but they're Jeff. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so both women were frequently subjected to partial strangulation during intercourse, with Tied once being told by a curtain, quote, that's what love means, unquote. What, being strangled? Apparently. Ugh. Um, when his wife found out about the affairs, um, Tied to reported him to the police, claiming that he had seduced her and the other girl alleged Curtin had, had raped her. The rape charge was dropped, but he did get a, an eight-month sentence for seduction and threatening behaviour. He served six months and then he was released on the condition that he relocated from Dusseldorf, but he successfully appealed against having to relocate, so he was allowed to stay in Dusseldorf. Mm. So they were trying to get him to move away. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah, but he successfully appealed against that, so he was allowed to stay in Dusseldorf. So on the 3rd of February 1929, he returned to his murdering ways um, and he stalked an elderly woman called Apollonia Kuhn. Um, he gra- he grabbed her by some bushes and dragged her into a nearby undergrowth where he then stabbed her 24 times with a pair of scissors. Um, oh, she actually did survive her injuries. Really? Yeah, wow. she did survive. Um, so, yeah. So, this is quite a bad one coming up. So, just... Okay. I'll just yeah. stick my fingers in my ears. Yeah. So, on the 8th of February, Curtin strangled a nine-year-old girl oh. named Rosa Ogler into unconsciousness before stabbing her in the stomach, temple, genitals and heart with a pair of scissors. He spontaneously ejaculated as he stabbed her. He then inserted his semen into her vagina with his fingers. Oh, God. He hid her body in a hedge and then returned several hours later and set her body on fire. Oh, that's horrendous. That's absolutely awful. Mm -hmm. Doesn't get any better, I'm afraid. (laughs) Five days later, on the 13th of February, Curtin murdered a 45-year-old mechanic called Rudolf Scheer, stabbing him 20 times. Did they... Rudolf, a man? Yeah. So did they ejaculate on him, or was it just women that he... No, um, it was just women. Just female? Yeah. So, despite the differences in age and sex, the fact all the crimes had been committed in Dusseldorf at dusk, and the amount of time each had been stabbed, the police thought that the same person was responsible, because obviously the police were clearly aware of all these incidences mm. but at, that, at this point they had no clue so they or, connected them all yeah they were basically trying to like connect them all and they basically had decided that this was like one person that was yeah. responsible um his next victim was a young woman named maria hathen he took her on a date in mm. very commas um, he le- lured her into a meadow where he strangled her stabbed her and sat on her body waiting for her to die he initially buried her body, but returned several weeks later with the intention of nailing her decomposing body to a tree in a mock crucif- crucif- crucifix- crucifixion, crucifixion. Yeah, to shock and disgust the public. Oh. However, her remains were too heavy for Curtin to complete his act, so he put her back where he had initially buried her. That's... Oh. Yeah. I, have, I have no words. Just yeah, carry on. This guy's good. Um... So three three months after Maria Hans' murder, he posted an, an anonymous letter which confessed to her murder and it, it actually enabled the police to find her body. Right. So mm-hmm. they come across her, which was, well, good for the family, obviously, so they could, you know, put her to, put her to rest nicely. Um, so Curtin then changed his... But he then, so, yeah, so well, those times he'd been kind of uh, killing with scissors quite a lot. So he then changed his choice of murder weapon from scissors to a knife to put police off the scent. So in the early hours of August the 21st, he randomly stabbed an 18-year-old girl, a 30-year-old man 
and a 37-year-old woman. All three of them were seriously injured, but they all survived. Okay. So his next victims were two foster sisters, aged five and 14. They were, they were walking home when Curtin approached and sent the older girl, Louise Lenzen, to get him cigarettes and he would give her money mm-hmm. um, when, when she returned. So when she was away, Curtin lifted the younger girl, Gertrude Hamacher, off the ground by her neck and strangled her before cutting her throat. When Louise returned, he partially strangled her before stabbing her and he also bit and cut her throat twice before sucking blood from her wounds. Oh. So he obviously thinks he's a vampire. Well, hence the vampire mm-hmm. disorder. Yeah. Because it's not the first time he does it. Ugh. Um, so the following day, Curtin accosted a 27-year-old housemaid called Gertrude Schlut. He asked her to have sex, to which she, to which she said no. So he shouted, um, in very commas, well die then. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, before repeatedly stabbing her in the head, neck, shoulder oh. and back. She did survive her injuries. Wow. Um, but was unable to, to give police a clear, clear description of, of who her attacker was. So unfortunately, she couldn't identify him at that point. Right. So Curtin attempted to murder two further victims, one by strangulation and another by stabbing in September. He then, he then switched his weapon of choice again to a hammer. So they just try to put the police off by yeah, like, changing yeah. weapons? So he started off with these scissors right. and he went to a knife and now he's gone to a hammer. Right. So the victims of Curtin's hammer attacks were a 31-year-old woman named Ida Ruter. They met at a train station. Um, she had uh, basically come to look for some like, work and... Um, like lodgings as they would call it back in those days yeah somewhere to stay um so yeah they met at a train station and she was persuaded to go to a cafe with him um on the way on the way and he repeatedly struck her about the head both before and after he raped her again i'm not sure if she i don't, I don't know i don't know if she died or not actually um 11 days later he attacked a 22 year old woman called elizabeth dorier she agreed to go for a drink she was struck across the temple with the hammer and then raped. She was then repeatedly struck. She was she was found alive but died from her injuries the next game day. This guy's just a monster. <laughs> he is, isn't he? Oh, well, I... actually, to be fair, like obviously, I know I called the case the vampire of Dusseldorf, but he was also known as the monster, monster. of Dusseldorf. So you had to do. But I thought the vampire one. Well, not that it sounded better, but do you know what I mean. It was a more interesting title. Mm. Um. So on the 25th of October, Curtin attacked another two women with a hammer and they both survived. So he didn't always successfully... No, I was just going to say, like, he's... um, This is going to sound weird, but I don't think he's a very good murderer. Like, I know he has murdered a few, Mm. but, like, he's not... There's quite a few that have survived as well. So to me, it's like... He just doesn't care. Like he doesn't care whether yeah. they whether they die or not. Like yeah, obviously like that's it's just a bonus if they do. I think, yeah, to like, him. Yeah. That, oh god. He just he just couldn't help himself. He just kept going and going and going. Um. So on the seventh of November, he met a five year old girl called Gertrude Alberman, and he persuaded her to come with him to a section of deserted allotments where he grabbed her by the throat and strangled her, strangled her, stabbing her once in the left temple with a pair of scissors, so he went back to his scissors. Uh, when Gertrude collapsed to the ground without a sound, Curtin stabbed her a further 34 times in the temple and chest. Wow. It's just disgusting. How many it? times have I said wow? I don't know, but that's what oh. I mean. It's just like the actual brutality of it as well, in, in some cases. I mean, that was a five-year-old girl. That it's just shocking, isn't it? Exactly. He witnessed to the chance probably after the first blow. No, yeah, I've been stabbed a thir- the further 34 times. It's just total overkill, isn't it? And it's mm-hmm. just like, so why is it, it just, does he enjoy it that much? Is that why? Yeah, I think like, so, yeah. Yeah, he just, he oh, just, he just, no. he did, he just enjoyed it and, and got off on it, really. As, as, as a, you know, it's horrendous. It is, it is. So by the late summer of 1929, the press had dubbed the murderer the vampire of Dusseldorf, yeah. which is obviously weird. My title has come from. 
Um, so the murder of Gertrude Alberman, who's the five-year-old girl that I just talked about, um, proved to be Curtin's final fatal attack. Mm. Um, although he did commit a spate of non-fatal hammer attacks and attempted strangulations between February and May 1930, he maimed 10 victims in, his, in these assaults. All the victims survived, and many were, on this, you know, were actually able to describe their attacker to the police. So I think like, the curtains were starting to, to come down yeah. a bit, I think, at this point. Um, so on the 14th of May 1930, an unknown man approached a 20-year-old woman called Maria Budlick Budlick at Dusseldorf Station. She had travelled, like the other woman, to Dusseldorf to look for a place to stay in employment. Um, the man offered to direct her to a hostel. She followed but became apprehensive when he tried to lead her through a park. At this point, I bet you're thinking that's him. Well, it wasn't. Oh. Um, they began to argue when another man approached, oh. asking whether Maria was being pestered by this by by the um, her companion, and she nodded, and the man she had been arguing with simply walked away. The man who had come to her aid was Peter Curran. So as he came to her aid just to attack her. <sighs> so Curran invited Maria back to his apartment for food and drink, and she made it clear that she was not interested in sex. But she's going to be, she's going to feel like she's sort of, not um, not that she owes him something, but like, you know, like, he must be friendly. Like, he's, he's kind of came in and he saved me, so like, yeah. he must be a nice guy. And why not go and have, a, back, go and have a, a drink with him and, you know, get to know him or whatever, because, you know, he's a nice guy. Well, exactly. Oh, God. Um, so, yeah, so she made it clear that she wasn't interested in sex. So, Curtin actually agreed to lead Maria to a hotel, but... Instead, he lured her to some woods where he seized her by the throat and attempted to strangle her, strangle her as he raped her. When Maria began began to scream, though, Curtin released his grasp on her on her throat before allowing her to leave. So again, he's it's weird, isn't it? Like he just like some people he's quite happy to go and kill, but there's been a few times where he's obviously attacked them, but he's not followed through and killed them. Yeah, it's very strange, isn't it? Yeah, it's almost like he was just like. I'm not good at this anymore, or I don't know. I don't know if he was just bothered or whatever. But you think that you know, who knows? You don't know what goes through the, these people's minds. I know exactly. So yeah, so she obviously managed to get away, but um, like Maria, she didn't actually report the assault to the police. Um, but back in those days, um, she had written a letter um to one of her friends who she actually described the ordeal to, ordeal to yeah. in this letter. Um, but she actually addressed the letter wrong. So the letter was actually opened by a clerk um, at the post office on the 19th of May. And upon reading it, the clerk forwarded the letter to the Dusseldorf police. Oh. Um, this was read by Chief Inspector Gannat, um, who thought there was a slim chance that this could be the, the Dusseldorf but, yeah. murder that, that they were obviously looking for. So Good for that clerk. Well, I know. I mean, but if she, hadn't, if she had addressed it correctly, yeah. I, mean, I mean, a friend would have... A friend might have... What well, might have reported, or at least she would have received the letter. So I mean, you don't know. It might have been reported another way, but if it hadn't been addressed long wrong, then it might not have. Well, it was obviously meant to get to the police, wasn't it? Well, exactly. So, excuse me. So Chief Inspector Gannat tracked down Maria, and he interviewed her. So she recounted her or- ordeal, further saying that one of the reasons Curtin had spared her was that she said that she couldn't remember his address. But she lied. Yeah. She did remember his address. Which is quite good that she took that in, considering yeah. she only went there the once to get some food and drink. Yeah. And then, um, so she actually agreed to lead the police to Curtin's address. So Curtin, he wasn't actually at ho- home initially um, when they arrived, but he, um, he did turn up soon after. And he spotted Maria and Chief Inspector Gannat. Um, so he actually quickly left. So he, they'd obviously turned up to his apartment he wasn't there. He then turned up, seen them, thought, oh, shit. Mm, yeah. You know, and obviously left. So knowing that his identity was, was now known, he actually confessed to his wife that he was a vampire of Dusseldorf. I didn't confess oh, that to your wife, eh? Imagine being the wife, like, what the... F- I don't think I'd believe it. I know, I'd be like... Well, I mean, I mean, you, you maybe would be like, well, yeah, you've been in prison for a few things, so I, I understand <laughs> you're maybe not like a, a squeaky clean yeah. guy. But I still think you'd be quite shocked that... Um, you know, she was obviously 
though he was the vampire of this order. So with his consent, he actually urged his wife to um, collect a substantial reward for his capture. So she contacted the police the following day because there would also been a reward put out for, um, you know, for any information on him. So yeah. he actually was like, no, you go and do that so you can get some money, basically. Yeah. <laughs> um, so at an arranged meeting point between Curtin and his wife, Curtin was arrested at gunpoint. He freely admitted his guilt to a total of 68 crimes, including nine murders and 31 attempted murders. <sighs> So actually, he didn't actually fully kill a lot of people. That nine, I mean, well, nine people's nine too I mean, many, of but it is. But in the terms of other people that he attacked, yeah, it's, I, I actually I'm surprised that I thought it was more than that. With mm. like listening to this story, like I thought it was more than that, but really? like yeah, it's still nine too many. Oh, yeah, of course it is. Yeah. Um. So he made no attempt to excuse his crimes, mm. um, and Curtin admitted to investigators that the sight of the victim's blood was often sufficient to bring him to orgasm. Oh. If he ejaculated upon strangling a woman, he would say sorry and proclaim, quote, that's what love's all about, end quote. <laughs> he further claimed to have drunk the blood from the throat of one victim from the, temp- from the temple of another and to have licked the blood from a third victim's hands. <sighs> In the case of Maria H- Hang, Han, he said he had drunk so much blood from her neck wound that he actually vomited. <sighs> Disgusting. Uh, uh, this this case is mm-hmm. awful. And Curran also admitted to having decapitated a swan in the spring of nineteen thirty in order so he could drink blood from the animal's oh. neck, atri- achieving ejaculation in the process. No, it's disgusting. Isn't it? You didn't. know should have put a trigger warning at the start I, of this I animal. Totally forgot about. It. I was. I actually it was like so engrossed in the murders. I forgot about all the animals as well. Oh, but that's still murder. Well, I know, but I forgot. Oh, Don't shout at me. <laughs> so on the 13th of April, 1931, Peter Curtin stood trial. He was charged with nine counts of murder and seven of attempted murder. Curtin pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity to each of the charges. But seven days into the trial, he actually changed his plea to guilty and he said he had no remorse and enjoyed it. Ugh. The trial lasted for ten days and the jury reached their verdict in under two hours. Curtin was found guilty and sentenced to death on nine counts of murder and he was also found guilty of the seven counts of attempted murder. Peter Curtin was executed by guillotine on the 2nd of July. And shortly before his head was placed on the guillotine, Curtin asked, quote, Tell me, after my head is chopped off, will I still be able to hear, at least for a moment, the sound of my own blood gushing from the stump of my neck? That would be the pleasure to end all pleasures. Oh... And just as a very horrible side note, after his execution, his head was bisected and mummified and his brain removed for forensic analysis in an attempt to explain his personality and behaviour. The examination revealed no abnormalities, so there was no Uh. mental abnormalities. But here's the, the actual crazy part. Shortly after the Second World War, Curtin's head was transported to America it is currently, to this day, on display at the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum in Wisconsin. And I have seen a picture of it. Why would you want to see that, though? I have no idea. Like, But his head is obviously, it's been mummified. Uh-huh. But it is but, on display in the Ripley's Believe It or Not in Wisconsin. So if you live in Wisconsin and you haven't seen it... I wouldn't want to see that, though. It is, like, disturbing. I, 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 I couldn't believe that when I read that. I was like... That whole case was disturbing. Yeah, it was pretty disgusting. It was. That was like that man was a monster. Oh, well, yeah, he, he was a monster. What? He was a vampire. He was absolutely sexually disturbed. He was just he was disgusting. just disgusting and disgusting and a monster and horrendous and it was horrific and gruesome and yeah. So I'm sorry to anybody that found that particularly gruesome, but it was a bad one. Um, and I just I can't believe his head's on display that you can actually go and see it. I just, yeah, I mean, like, why, why are you displaying this monster's head? Like, why is, it, why, to me, that's kind of glorifying it. Like, well, exactly. Like, he should not be glorified in any shape no, or form. No, exactly. What he did was horrific to the the people that he murdered, to the people that he attacked, to the animals that he attacked. Yeah, yeah just all of it. All just, of it is just so. So to put his head on display mm-hmm. for people to go and look at all these years later. For all these years. Like, no, because I mean, Ripley's, I mean, no. I've, been, I've been to like, Ripley's, believe it or not, and obviously it's meant to be like 
all these fascinating out of this world things that have happened like i don't know like the world's tallest man or mm. you know random stuff but to but me that's not random things like that are fascinating and they're interesting mm. to me a serial killer as somebody who has done that much stuff to that you know as i said to, to people to animals to children that's not fascinating that's not mm. something that i'm interested in i mean in the sort of true crime world yeah. yes like mm. But not in that sense, as in I, that I want to go and see his head. Well, yes, I have to say, yeah, you wouldn't want to go and see that in a, muse- well, to a museum-type place yeah. that the, his head is displayed there. No. No, I, that's... I just thought that was quite... Yeah, that was horrific. So thank you, everybody, for listening. If you managed to stick with yes. the whole episode, then thanks a lot. And for because... anybody that was disturbed by it, I truly am sorry. Yeah, but... and um, if anybody has left, I don't blame them because... I think maybe I would have if I was actually listening to that podcast. I think I might have just went, you know what? That's too gruesome for me. That's too gruesome. I know. But, yeah. So thanks to everybody for listening. Um, If you'd like to join us on Patreon, it's patreon.com slash crime divers and you'll get bonus episodes and all that good stuff. And if you want to follow us or get in contact with us, our information is in the show notes. And, of course, as always, if you haven't already, please don't forget to subscribe, rate and review. And... Obviously, don't be such a on this episode. No! <laughs> <laughs> That's what I said. Bye!